What's the worst mistake that you've ever made on a baseball field? That error that you wish you could take back. That call as a coach that didn't go at all the way that you thought it would. That that one that you're sure that everybody thinks of when they look at you. I remember uh, the very first play my senior year of high school. It stands out to me to this day. I was playing third base, ground ball to me. I booted it. And so the guy's going to be safe at first, and I wasn't satisfied with that. I picked it up, chucked it over the first baseman's head. Two errors on one play, and I thought, boy, this is how my senior year is going to go. I thought I was going to be defined by those kinds of errors. We've all had those things on or off the field, some uh, as as minor as an error at third base, some as catastrophic as as something that really does uh, ruin a family, ruin a relationship, ruin a life on or off the field we have the tendency i believe to define ourselves sometimes at least by the worst things that we've ever done and there's a good chance that 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 kind of thing right now is crushing you if that's you and you go back maybe it's something on the field that happened years ago uh, and and you just can't get over it and you felt like you let your team down or you lost a game for them or a championship or whatever it was and you've carried that around and it has affected you so much and you know that every time people think of you that's the story that they tell. So maybe it's something on the field as a player or as a coach, or maybe it's off the field. And and you've just, you know, you know that when you walk up, that's the story that they're going to tell as you walk away. You know, let me tell you about this guy. Here's what he did. But on and off the field, what if, just for a second, think about this. What if, what if you are not defined, truly not defined by the worst thing that you've ever done, the worst error that you've ever made, the worst character trait that you have. You're not defined by what people have come to think of you to this point. Uh, that, what, it, what if? So, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome to the Baseball Church. My name is Brad. I'm glad to be with you today for the week of July 5th, 2020. Uh, that's what we'll look at, as I said, today uh, in the study, uh, our study of the life of Moses in nine innings. We're moving into the top of the second, and it's in this top of the second, if you will, that Moses makes the greatest mistake of his life so far. Now, on the top of the first, we looked at how how the Israelites, the Hebrew people, were down big. I mean, they had a bad top of the first inning. In fact, the Pharaoh, uh, the the, the king of the land where they lived there in Egypt, he decided he was going to to put them into slavery because they were outnumbering the Egyptians and he was scared. And boy, they are, I mean, literally down big. So for a a long, long time, uh, these people are in slavery. That top of the first lasted for 400 years. And, and then in the bottom of the second, we see that they weren't out of it yet, or the bottom of the first, rather, they weren't out of it yet. There's a little hope that there was a child who was born, that, that we get a preview that one day this child, who we would later know as Moses, was going to grow up and be this great deliverer for the Israelites. And so that's, that's what we, we kind of pick it up at. And then on the top of the second, this child is growing up and he's making all kinds of of error. So I want you to, to join me. If you've got your Bible, we'll be in Exodus chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up in verse 11 today. We're just going to read a verse or two and stop and kind of pause and pick it apart and kind of go from there. So if you've got your Bible, look in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, years later, now this is years after Moses uh, had, had become part of the, the Egyptian court, if you will. Years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their forced labor, their forced labor. So he goes out to his own people. And so in a way, Moses is still really searching for what's going to define him. He was born a Hebrew, obviously, uh, but since that was a death sentence for Hebrew baby boys during the time that Moses was born, his mom figured out a way to save him. Uh, but that meant that he was going to be raised by the Egyptian uh, princess. And so Moses becomes a, a member of the Egyptian court. Uh, life as an Egyptian prince obviously must have been spectacular. I mean, we, we, we're not even, I, I can't understand that. Uh, but apparently there was something that was nagging at Moses. It was, it was this is not who I am. I, I know I'm different. And, and I know, I, I'm sure he, he came to understand he was a Hebrew. He was not an Egyptian. And yet he's living this life that wasn't his. And so he's, he's defined by this being an Egyptian prince that really isn't him. And so he goes out to his own people to see what life was really like for them. And then look at verse, uh, the end of verse 11. It says, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. So, of course, this is a slave master beating one of the slaves. And then then it says, one of his own people. And boy, there's something right there that happens inside of Moses. and, And something triggers him. Beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, it says. And then verse 12, looking around and seeing no one, 
he struck the Egyptian dead and hid him in the sand. Something overwhelms him. Something stops him that day. Something deep inside happens to Moses there in verses 11 and 12. He, he identified with the Hebrew people in a way that he never had before. And his anger boils over. And he committed the greatest error of his life. And, and then he keeps making it worse. Uh, you can tell here he looks around and he doesn't see anybody. And he figures, okay, I'm going to get away with this. And he kills this, he, this Egyptian slave master and buries him, hid, hides him, the Bible says, in the sand. He buries him there in the sand. Uh, and then look at verse 13. The next day he went out. And he saw two Hebrews fighting. And so again, here, here, here's this thing, this, this recurring theme. The Bible has a way of doing this. First, he sees a Hebrew getting beaten by an Egyptian slave master. And the next day, he sees two Hebrews fighting. And he says to the Hebrews, he asked the one in the wrong, why are you attacking your neighbor? And then verse 14, who made you leader and judge over us? Well, what the irony here is really, really thick is eventually Moses will be the leader and judge over the Hebrews. He says, who made you leader and judge over us? Are you planning to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses became afraid and thought, what I did is certainly known. Then look at verse 15. When Pharaoh heard about this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. I mean, this is, I mean, what an incredible thing. There's so much uh, preview here. There's so much parallelism with other verses in the Bible. Why are you attacking your neighbor? Uh, and, then, and then, boy, isn't it interesting that eventually Moses will get the law to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Moses will be given that by God. And this Hebrew slave kind of gives us a preview. Moses is, 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 is kind of rebuked, if you will, for not loving his neighbor who wasn't even his people. It was his this Egyptian slave master, that was that he killed his own neighbor, and he kind of get a preview of that. Interesting. Anyway, uh, he he hadn't gotten away with what he thought he'd gotten away with. Uh, everybody knows. That, I mean, how in the world could could these two Hebrews know? And then Pharaoh, of course, finds out, and and now he's defined as being a murderer. That's who Moses is known as. Now the Hebrews don't want to associate him. Pharaoh wants to kill him, and he's defined by being a murderer, uh, by being a wanted man, by being now a fugitive on the run. Uh, the top of the second, if you will, has not been good to Moses. The, the, the hope from the bottom of the first inning now would seem to be completely gone. Uh, well, we're not out of it yet. Well, yeah, pretty much you are. So he sits down by a well, it says. Now imagine this just washing over him. He runs and runs and runs and finally finds a source of water. He sits down to try to get a drink or at least to cool himself off in the desert. And imagine that washing over him. I guarantee you've been there. You have had those moments where everything that you've done to this point, the mistakes and errors that you've made, finally begin to just wash over you, and there you sit. And you can imagine the emotion that Moses is experiencing. And then look at verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Now it's very interesting. It's just the way the way this story goes. Well, hey, by chance, this priest had seven daughters. They came to draw water and to fill the troughs uh, to, uh, to water their flo father's flocks. Verse 17, then some shepherds arrived and drove them away. But Moses came to their rescue and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Ruel, they, he asked, why have you come back so quickly? And they answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. So where is he? He asked his daughters in verse 20. Why then do you, did you leave the man behind? Invite him to dinner. I mean, isn't that great? What are you doing? This guy helped you guys. He saved you, and you're just going to leave him sitting out there? Go get the guy, and let's at least feed him. Moses agreed to stay with the man in verse 21, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. She gave birth to a son whom she named Gershom, for he said, I have become a stranger in a foreign land. So we, we get a glimpse, really, of Moses' true character. I mean, he... We, we understand, you know, he's not all bad, if you will. He's not all mistakes and errors. In his, in his actions toward these women, when these, these shepherds come and run the women off from the well, and of course during that time, women were treated as if they were just property or worse. Uh, and so Moses rescues them. He comes to the rescue. What a great preview of, of, of who God is toward women. You know, it's uh, it, 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 Jesus, of course, coming to the woman at the well and and, and elevating her, talking with her, and giving her a different place in society than she had ever known before. What, what a great preview of that. But, but he begins here a new life, Moses does. It, it's as if he, he figures that you, you can kind of see him, well, here's my chance. I, 
I, I've rescued these women. They come back, they invite me to dinner, and now this man wants to give his daughter to me in marriage. Moses is probably around 40 years old at this point, uh, and so he's, he's going to begin a new life. And, and you wonder, you wonder if he ever tells them anything about it. But either way, he's going to live this fake life in the middle of a place that he's never been, a nobody in the middle of nowhere. And, and maybe now, maybe now he thinks that error won't catch up to him. And, and it may, in a sense, I guess he's just kind of quit the game. He's just stopped playing. Uh, you know, and, and, and it begs the question, have, have you ever been there? Uh, have, have you ever just run from the mistakes that, that you've made? Sure you have. Sure I have. All of us. Have you ever just wanted to quit on and or off the field? you ever felt like you're defined by the worst mistake that you've ever made, the worst thing that you've ever done, the worst error you've ever made on or off the field, the worst of who you are, and that the only way to avoid that definition is to run away and start over somewhere else? Now, listen, there may be somebody who's watching this who that's exactly what you've done, literally and physically, you have run from your situation. You have moved from where you were, and you now live somewhere else. But that, that's not usually the way that we do it. Usually what we do is we just try to avoid it. We just try to pretend it's not there, like it didn't happen, like, like there's some way that we can avoid those things. Uh, and if that's you, if you've ever done that, if you've ever been so worn out by the, the worst of you defining you, if that's ever been the case, then, then you need to keep reading. Look in verse 23. After a long time, the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor, and they cried out, and their cry for help ascended to God because of the difficult labor. Verse 24. So God heard their groaning, and He remembered His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the chapter ends with this verse. God saw the Israelites, and God knew. Now I want you to consider a couple of things here. First of all, I want you to consider Moses as he experienced this particular story. He didn't know about verses 23 and 22, uh, 24, 25 when he was going through it. He, he, did, he was just living out the rest of his life, he thought, there in Midian, uh, trying to forget and avoid what he had done. And maybe that's how you feel right now, that Moses didn't know what was coming next. And, and that's, that we have to understand that, that, that he's, uh, he, he doesn't know. And maybe you're the same way. You're just trying to avoid it, trying to pretend like it doesn't happen. Maybe it won't bother me anymore. I just, I'm so tired of being defined by the worst. Maybe if I just start over, do something different, things will change. And then I want, secondly, I want you to consider Moses as he wrote it, because he was the author, after all, of this book of Exodus. Uh, he was honest about his failures. But as he wrote it, he just moved on to the next thing that God was doing, uh, which was uh, his grace and mercy uh, and so on. It, his His... His failures, if you will, Moses' failures, uh, his errors, his top of the second inning, that was just another thing that God was going to overcome, uh, to overwhelm with his grace and his mercy in his story of delivering uh, the Israelites, of rescuing them from slavery. This story wasn't about Moses. It was about God. Don't miss that. Moses is writing this story. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm writing this story, I spend a whole lot more time beating myself up over the bad thing that I did right here. Oh, I'm so terrible. I'm so awful. You guys, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how bad I feel about this. That's not where Moses was. That's not what he did. He just told the story. Look, here's what happened. Understand, he's the author. Here's what happened. This guy, Moses, who happens to be me, this guy, Moses, did these things. And then there's sort of that but God moment. I have become a stranger, he says, in a foreign land. That's what he named his son. That's what it meant, which leads quickly to God saw the Israelites and God knew. I'm a stranger in a foreign land. God saw and God knew. So consider Moses as he wrote it. But, but also thirdly, consider the Israelites as they would read it years later. I mean, this is their story of deliverance. And in a sense, they could say, you know what, not even the worst of what we, even our great leader, not even the worst of what we've done, not even the worst of who we are, uh, is too much for God to overcome. They, they would have remembered uh, that Moses made a mistake, but that's not how they would have remembered Moses. Not for his big mistake, but as the man that God used to bring them out of slavery. That's who they knew Moses as. They would have known about his flaws. They read the story just like we just did. But they would have known only so that they could then see how great God was in comparison. Because this story, as I said, this story is not about Moses. It's about God. And then finally, consider this story now in, in light of the whole story that we know. Now, as I've said all along, at the top of the first and the bottom of the first, this story of Moses, this is our spiritual heritage. If you're a believer in Jesus, way back when is when it started. This is what leads up to our great Savior. Uh, this is not some 
ancient story that we have no connection to. This is our spiritual heritage. Moses is one of us, if you will. If you're a believer in Jesus, he is one of us. He wasn't superhuman. In fact, he was a murderer. <laughs> he was a fugitive. He was a nobody in the middle of nowhere. And at one point, he was defined by the worst error he had ever made. But that's not where God left him. God saw and God knew. Now let that sink in for a minute. God sees your errors. God knows the worst of you. But that's not what this line really is even about in Exodus. Because it says God saw the Israelites and God knew what they were going through and God was going to use this incredibly flawed man to do something about it, to deliver God's people. God wasn't done with them and He wasn't done with Moses. Moses was not going to be defined by his biggest error, but by the grace of God. And this wasn't a story of Moses picking himself up and God saying, dude, come on, you know what, figure it out. That's not what God did. This was a story of God invading Moses' life and turning it around when everything seemed lost. God was the hero of Moses' story. Now you fast forward to the New Testament and you see the same thing that God wants to have play out uh, as we come to know Jesus. God saw and God knew the condition of the world, the darkness in the hearts of people because of their sin. And He didn't tell them to pick themselves up. That's not what He did, and that's not what He does. He didn't tell them, just stop being defined by all those things. Instead, what He did was send His Son to live the life that they and that we couldn't. He sent His Son to die the death that we deserve. He sent His Son to rise again so that we could be guaranteed that our greatest errors no longer define us. And if you're walking around right now defined by the greatest error, the worst thing that you've ever done on or off the field, I believe Jesus wants to give you a brand new identity today. And when you know Him, you don't have to run anymore. You won't have to pretend those things didn't happen. They happened. But like Moses, you can write it into the story as just another thing that God overcame through the grace of Jesus. And today, by surrendering completely, surrendering your life completely to Jesus, you can be defined by His best and not your worst. And that's a pretty good trade, isn't it? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this story, for this top of the second in the life of Moses. And we thank you that we are not defined by our worst, but we can be defined by the best of Jesus, by his life, his death, his resurrection. So, Lord, through faith, I pray that folks would trust you today, that their lives would be dra drastically changed forever, and no longer would they be defined by the worst of who they are, but by the best of who Jesus is. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that God blesses you on and off the field. We'll see you next time, church. Thanks again for joining us for the Baseball Church. If you'd like more information about Baseball Pastor Ministry, check out BaseballPastor.com. You'll see our blog and links to various resources. We'd love to connect with you there or on our various social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks again for being with us. See you next time.